So at this point, we've got the brand new colors of our project. We've got this new uh, color palette, hopefully. And on my case, I've got the three to choose from A, B, C. And we've seen that we need to switch the data theme unless we use the default. Um, we are not going to be able to access those other data themes, those other colors, until we explicitly say so. So I've also got it working on my device. And I bet from a distance it looks like I've got Facebook, but it's not Facebook, it's my app. So, um, we have a new color palette. Now let's deal with, uh, with fonts. So, the thing about fonts is that this relates also to what I'm talking about here now, these changing these colors and such. This could have applied also to a plain old web project. It doesn't necessarily have to be an Android or iPhone project. That, that's just CSS applied to a website. That's nothing special. That's why I'm simply running it off my browser to test it. But it then does easily apply to a device. Same thing with what I'm going to talk about with fonts. With fonts, we have just hearkening back to plain basic CSS stuff to add to a website. Let's take a quick <coughs> look at this. If you go back to your project, open your project, your WW folder, and open the open the codica.extra.css file codica.extra external whatever it means codica.external.css and you've got a section here that defines the body the basics of the body um, a few things that we mentioned previously and remember line 7 line 7 says font family and that's a list of possible fonts to choose from to display in the project. Now, depending on the device that this is loaded on, it'll try to access one of those. If it's on an, if it's on an Android, it's going to try to see, do we have these two? These are two common Android fonts. Okay, we're not on an Android, we're on an iPhone. It'll go next. Segoe UI and Segoe Regular are actually Windows fonts, so that's going to get skipped. And then it's going to go over to San Francisco and Hel Helvetica New. Those are Mac fonts. Those are iOS fonts, so then it'll use those. And then some very generic ones in case we're not on any of those three devices. We might be on Blackberry, Firefox OS, whatever. And those fonts are not available, so there's a whole list of possibilities instead. Now this works because this assumes that that font exists in one of those devices, or if none of those, it will default to the very most basic sans serif. That's the most basic kind of font, a sans serif font. And serif means the little ornamentations on your fonts. Um, let me show you here. So I've got this particular font. I've got this font, look the way it looks, and then if I've got um, a different version of the font, let's see here. So clearly they're different fonts, but they hail from very from basically two big families, serif and sans serif. Sans serif. So this is a serif font. This is a sans serif <coughs> font. So, the serifs are these little ornamentations on the on the letters. This T, that's a T, but it's got this little bit of flourish here. They have specific names in the world of, you know, fonts. Uh, that little thing right there, that's a little, that's a serif as well. These little things that kind of show off the font a bit. These little stylistic things. So look at that. Look at the word the on top of there and down here. Look at this ornamentation. These are the serifs, sans serifs from French sans, which I think means without, or not, so without, without serifs, without the ornamentation, sans serif. <coughs> That's what my code is saying. Try all of these fonts, and if they all fail, just choose whatever sans serif font you want to the, to the operating system. So those are the two big families. We've got <coughs> serif and then sans serif. Well, I got those backwards. Sans serif right here. And then the one down here is serif.
and there are other styles of fonts as well, like calligraphy or uh, fantasy and such, but those are the big ones. So in the old days of making websites, we were at a big disadvantage. We would look over at our graphic design brethren and be jealous. So basically graphic design is anything printed, like the stuff on the wall, and web design is anything on the web. Graphics on the web, graphics in print, basically. Graphic design, web design. Us as web designers we would be jealous of the graphic designers because they had all those cool fonts to work with. And they had margins and alignment and all that cool stuff, and we didn't. We, we had websites that looked weird and had these basic fonts and we couldn't align things, we couldn't put one picture next to text like our graphic design people could do for decades. We couldn't do that. So then we cheated with tables and such. We don't use tables anymore, so don't worry. We use CSS. And so CSS allowed us to do great design, just like the graphic designers. But what really <coughs> lagged still were fonts. We still couldn't show cool fonts on the web very easily. I have 2,000 fonts on my computer, and I can write code on my website to, sh to use the chiller font. But that font might not show up for someone else's computer if they don't have chiller installed on their computer. So if someone's on the Mac, they don't have chiller, chiller is usually a Windows font, then that font goes back to basics. So for a long time we couldn't do cool fonts on the web, then we cheated with that too. We did fonts as graphics. We opened up Photoshop or whatever graphic software and made something, a graphic of text. We wrote that cool word in whatever font we wanted as a graphic and put it on our websites then that was a problem because it would slow down the website, it wasn't search engine friendly, a bunch of problems. Eventually CSS3 came about and really solidified a standard that we can all use now to use any font on any computer with no problem, without graphics and other cheats. And so if you go online and search at font dash face. That's the secret, so that's CSS3. Technically it did come out in CSS2 times, but it wasn't really uh, embraced enough until modern CSS3 times, or you know, eras. And so at font dash face, this is a CSS construct for CSS3, and you can look it up how it works exactly. Um, we're going to do it the, the easier way, the cool way. Uh, we're going to apply whatever font we want, basically, to our, to our projects, and it's not going to be graphics-based. It's going to be font-based. So it'll also load faster, render better, because if we designed a graphic <laughs> at a certain size, and then the graphic grows and shrinks, it might lose quality. But if we put our text as actual text, it'll grow and shrink and be nice and sharp because the devices can handle plain old text better than graphics. And so the way we're going to do this is, let's go to this website called fontsquirrel.com because the other big problem with fonts is we, we think of fonts as a given, as this free thing that we can find online in our computer and use for whatever purpose. Technically fonts also exist in the realm of photography where hopefully you know by now that you shouldn't really just go online and rip off graphics because someone probably owns the rights to that graphic. There are photographers out there that spend their time shooting photos and making money off their photos. So if you go to some photographer's blog, find a cool photo, download it and print it, you stole it from them. And now we have a really big culture, for good or for bad, of like sharing everything online, but there are still laws, there are still you know, trademarks and patents and copyrights and all of that, and we should do our best to know about them and adhere to them, and that's why I want to show as much as possible the free stuff, the stuff that won't get you in trouble. And so that's also with fonts. Fonts <coughs> are things that can also be for sale. Believe it or not, but I've seen fonts that cost more than your computer. Fonts that cost $2,000. More than two of your computers. So I'm going to guide you again to the best free stuff. Question. Is this the same as web fonts? Uh, no, web fonts is from Google, and this is from Font Squirrel. 
So this kind of repository here is a collection of fonts that we can use. And notice at the very top left, 100 free for commercial use fonts. I mean 100% free for commercial use fonts. Because I can go to many, many websites out there such as 1001freefonts.com. That's another place. I can get a bunch of fonts. I can go to the places where it is okay for me to use these fonts because I, I know in my career as a web designer slash graphic designer there was always be a client that would that would say you know our previous person did this and now we don't work with them can you recreate our business card well their business card relied on a very special font and, we, and I would tell them you know this font is a proprietary font you just can't find it anywhere and use it on your on your card you say how, how is that possible fonts fonts are fonts I've got 200 fonts on my computer why can't I get that font of my company just like the coca-cola font only Coca-Cola has the Coca-Cola font. There are variations of it that we might find, but the real official Coca-Cola font, you know, that's, that worth, that's worth a million dollars. That's the official Coca-Cola font. And so if you go to the right place to find fonts, you know, all of this, but we're not going to look at free, 1001 free fonts at the moment. We're going to look at Font Squirrel. The reason for this is because this gives, this, this also gives it to us as a font kit. The way this works, the way at font face works, is it's a bit of CSS that basically checks the device. Let's display this font. Is the device capable of displaying this version? Yes or no? If it's not, then it says try this version. If that one's not, try this version, and then that one will work. So the at font face kit is a collection of the fonts that should work. 99% of the time on all devices. And that's what Font Squirrel is all about. You can go to many, many sites such as Google Web Fonts to get a bunch of free fonts. But this one packages it all together so that it's ready for us to use in our app the fastest way. The only trick is, I wish they would make it a little bit more obvious, you see all these great fonts, but the trick is that not all of them are, are quickly available for us to use. Notice all of these icons here. We want to use the fonts that have all the icons active. Use this font for all of these purposes. Desktop, web, mobile. This one is only desktop. It's totally free for use when you use it on a plain old website. Or, or desktop, I guess, technically. And so, I like this site a lot. You're not going to get a million fonts here. You're going to get lots of fonts. Hopefully one of them is a perfect one. And the way that I recommend that we'll do this is go to font scroll here, and on the right side, scroll down on the right sidebar, find the area that says font filter and select web font. This is the web font license. Click on that. And then here you get lots and lots of results with different styles and everything, you know, SF archery, etc. And these are all marked with the icons that I'm asking you to to use. So let's say you're browsing and you would think that you know this font right here, an Anudwa, would look great on my app. Or maybe, you know, anagram. Let's say you like one of these fonts. I'm gonna select your SF Archery. Don't click simply the download file. That's just going to give you the raw font file. We want the variations of the font files that are compatible with all the devices and the code that will make it work. If you simply click download there, it's incomplete. You want to do, what you want to do is click on the font name itself. That will take you to like the, the screen that focuses on the font. So I like SF Archery. You can do whichever you like. But I'm going to click SF Archery. Still, don't click on that download button there. This focuses on this particular font, Archery Black. Here's some specimens. It comes in these different styles, regular, <coughs> oblique, SC, oblique, etc. So regular, here's all of the letters of the alphabet, numbers and such. How does it look in various sizes? 
information about it. <coughs> the thing about fonts, this is another form of design. It's a very, very important form of design. Again, maybe most of us here are programmers. We don't have an eye for this. This is fine. If you like the way it looks like, that's fine. But this is also a bigger topic of the concepts of design, and really what you need to think about is readability. There's lots of cool fonts out there, but think about them in terms of readability. Think in terms about the fonts that you see on all your favorite apps. There may be a very interesting, crazy-looking font, but it's most likely used very sparingly, like for the logo or the heading, you know, these splashes of an interesting font. The regular font is often a plain old Arial or variation of Arial, variation of Times New Roman, those very readable basic fonts. The one that is in our code here, that's what it's saying. Look at these very basic readable sans serif fonts. If you don't have a trained eye, they all look like Arial. They have nuances, but they all break down to Arial, sans serif, super basic. And what we want to do is choose an interesting font, but maybe not one of these interesting ones for the basic text of our app. The basic text of our app, our P tags, should be plain old fonts, readable fonts. The H1 tag, H2, H4, and such, those are the ones that I'm really going to uh, stylize with some of these fonts. So that's why it's still a good idea before we go to the download process. Click up here where it says test drive, and you can actually type here. You can type what are you trying to display before you download it. Take it for a test drive. I want to use this for various headings in my project. That's what that looks like, and change its sizes and and this oblique version, which is italics. Let's see what's the difference between black and SC. Oh, I see it's all caps. You see it down there again in, in different styles. You can take a, a look at the glyphs. Here you see all of the characters included, so here's another reason to test drive these a bit, because what if you really need you know, foreign uh, letters? and their, your particular font that you're thinking of getting doesn't have that letter. You could be wasting your time. And then the license, you know, usually everything that you're looking at here, these are free. <coughs> and so forth, so no warranty. <coughs> So if you include it in an app that you're going to charge for? Well, you have to check the license, but most of the time what we're trying to get out of this site, it says here, free for commercial use. That's why, you know, that's why it guided us here, too. Um, that's why we could go over to you know, 1001 free fonts, and we can go over to other font sites, but then the fine print says, do not use for commercial purposes. This one, we're here, we don't have a million fonts to choose from, but we hopefully get one that looks nice and we're safe with. Okay, so how we actually use this. Let's say I found the perfect font. You should then see WebKit font. If you don't see the link to WebKit font, you did not n narrow down your search here to web fonts. If you're in anything else, you might not see the web font kit. So if you don't have that, choose another font. So under web kit font, it says this font's license appears to allow you to use at font face CSS embedding. So it's going to let us use this in our app via CSS, commercial free and such. And so this is what we want, this kit here. Not just the plain old download that one file, this is basically the Windows version of the font. Um, here, it's the kit is going to include the Windows version, the more modern, supposedly open source version. Uh, one of these two is a modern open source version. The SVG version for high quality, you know, Retina displays and such. 
It says right here, <laughs> the TTF really works most on, well, that's interesting, Internet Explorer and iPhones. The EOT version works in Internet Explorer only. The WAF version is a new standard, and the SVG is for iPhones, iPads. So the point of that is, I want my app to work and look the same and look nice on all devices. I'm going to use CSS, the at font face code, to display my, my font, and I'm going to include all possible versions of the font so that it must work on one of the devices. From this screen, click on Download at Font Face Kit. Download that, save it. Probably ended up on your desktop. I'm going to save a copy of it also into my flash drive. So whatever yours was called, mine went to the desktop, mine's called SF Archery Black Font Face Kit. It'll give you a font face kit with the name of your with the name of your font, which you will need to extract. So after you download it, go ahead and extract it. This is where there's going to be variation for some of these things, and then it'll be consistent for, for other things. So, you know, what I say is, I hope it's generic enough, but it's probably going to vary depending on your font. First, what I get is I extracted mine, and I get a folder, web fonts. I get an HTML file, how to use them, and the license, the thing that no one reads but everyone agrees to. So I'm going to open the HTML file. installing. So it says upload your web fonts. Okay, it just basically means add them to your project. They should be in or near the same directory as your CSS files. Include the web font style sheet. A special CSS at font face declaration helps the various browsers select the appropriate font it needs without causing you a bunch of headaches. You can go on to read about that. So here's the actual code. This line of code basically activates the font. We still need other code, but here <coughs> we're going to write at font face, open, close, curly braces. It's like a plain old um, CSS rule, but it's very special because it's got at at the front. Very few of the rules have that. It's usually dot or hash mark or, or nothing, but here it's an at. And so this is basically saying we're activating a font. Which one? Font family, my web font whatever yours is called. And we will see the example of it when we actually look in the folder. Uh, so literally, don't we don't type this, because my font is not called my web font. Mine is called SF Archery. So we're saying, I'm using my font. Semicolon. The source of it is the address webfont.eot, the EOT version of the font. Well, if my device can't handle it, try this one instead, the EOT IE fix version. Okay, if that one doesn't work on my device, try the WAF version. <coughs> if that one doesn't work, try the TTF version, and if that one doesn't work, try the SVG version. So all of the devices out there are going to work with one of these. Uh, we might simply just uh, point it to a style sheet file. We'll see what our what our zip file gave us, and then we need to add this to our particular our own CSS file. We'll still most likely use our codica.external.css. After we've activated the use of the font, then we can apply it to our elements. Here, the example is on our p tags, the font family will be my web font. We're going to do that with h1, h2, etc. Then you test it. Some troubleshooting stuff, that's nice. 
So in my particular unzipped folder, I've got then web fonts inside of web fonts. Mine's got the oblique version, the regular, the SC version, and the SC oblique regular. I want to use um, black regular, so let me look inside of that one, whichever one you like, but I'm going to go in here. So let's see what I've got. A style sheet file, all of the possible versions of the font, a demo of it. So if I open that, so there it is. If you open the demo, it's just showing you what your font looks like in all of these sizes. layout, so how it would look on that kind of design, and how to install it. There it is again. Specimen files. Oh, those are just the, those are just the files that come with, those are just the files that are necessary for this HTML sort of demo. <coughs> style sheet file. I'm going to look at, I'm going to look inside of that style sheet file. Look at that. At font face, here's my particular one. The demo page said font family, my web font. Mine is actually font family, sf underscore archery underscore black regular. So if you type exactly what mine says and you did not download the sf regular font, it will not work, obviously. If you downloaded a font you know, called Crazy Cat, your code is going to reflect that, so check, take a look at your CSS file. Um, okay, how do we actually add this? I'm going to close that file. So, in my app, www file, The way I'll add it is um, well for a little organization. Let's create a folder. Let's create a folder um, in your WW folder. So we've got a folder themes. This is our custom theme. We'll create a folder in the WW folder called fonts. Kind of, if we drag the whole web fonts folder, it will have the different versions of all of my possible fonts, which I have to add a little bit more code to activate them all. I could drag this one folder also, but then I just have to remember that my path has to be this name of this folder. So we've got a couple of ways to do it. So I've made a brand new folder called fonts, and what I really only need from my actual fonts are the actual font files, the EOT, SVG, TTF, and WAF, and that style sheet that activates them. The specimens and the HTML, I don't really need those, those are just for the demo. So I'm going to drag those over into my fonts folder of my app. And so I next need to connect this style sheet file to my index file into my project. And then that'll activate the fonts. And then to actually use the fonts, I just have to call those fonts. So let's go back to our index file in Notepad. <coughs> index file. So 
the same block where we added this stuff, I will add it again. I, I, I want to make Rodika EXT the last one in the group because it does go in order, remember? Set CSS like this, and then like this, and then like this. So my override, my external <coughs> Kodika one, I'm still going to keep it the last one. So within, within that line, new line 13, I'm going to uh, copy line 12. It's going to be another it's going to be another style sheet reference. Remember it's in a folder. Fonts slash uh, style sheet dot CSS. So now my index file has access to all of those possibilities of fonts. <coughs> Basically, the purpose of that is to give you the possibility to use the fonts. Then in my Kodika file, I will say, for my headings, use this font and that font and this font. Okay, so now we'll go over to the Kodika EXT CSS file. Um, the basic body text, I, I am going to leave it as a plain old readable font. And then we'll say right after body. H1, curly brace, open close curly brace, font dash family colon, and here's where we list our fonts. Again, don't literally type my web font because your font is most likely not called my web font. I have to open my demo file. In, or my CSS file, that is stylesheet.css. I have to open that for it to tell me exactly what it's called, but that's the basic structure there. Uh, I copy that out of the demo because, again, try this. If that one fails, try that. Try that. If all else fails, try that. I want my cool new font that I just loaded from Font Squirrel, so I need to, I need to get the name of that uh, out of the out of the CSS file, and then I'll paste it in there. Let's see. That's inside the CSS file. In my case, line 2, SF archery, blah, blah, blah. So in those quotes, it can be single or double. I'm just leaving single quotes. But now I'm saying, let's <coughs> use this font on my heading one. What is the purpose of the single quotes? There's no there's no purpose, it's whatever you'd like it to be. It is a little faster to type single quotes because you type single quote. Double quotes you have to do shift quote. So there's no right or wrong, it's just that sometimes some people use singles, sometimes use people use doubles. But we do need to have the one or the other, remember, on those cases where we have quotes around, double quotes around something, and inside of that we need to do double quotes again. So we have double quotes on the outside and single quotes on the inside. So in any event, just um, this is just shorthand. So here we worked with a bunch of files. The style CSS file, the Kodika file, the index file. Make sure you save all, just in case, save all. Go back to the index file and run it quickly in the browser. You don't have to do taco run browser yet. It should work in the plain old browser, Firefox. Look at that. My new cool font. <coughs> Hard to read, but I can <coughs> further refine that. <coughs> Let's say um, 
I wanted that font to be used more than once. It's only at the top. I want it on the footer. I want it on where it says welcome. You know, it should, it should show up on all of your headers at the top because that's an H1 at the top, isn't it? Yes. Which one is this here? H2. That's an H2. What about this one down here? H4. H4. So what I can do, if we go back to the CSS file, Kodika, I'm saying to heading 1, apply this font. I want to say to heading 1 and heading 2 and 3 and 4. And I can easily do that by saying h1, comma, h2, comma, h3, comma, h4, comma. Now all four of them are going to get that font. What's the reason you need to quotes around? There's the quotes around it, and then the comma, and then a space. Well, they don't have quotes around it. Yes, oh. Okay, I see, yes. Um, this particular basic font here uh, is also noticed. This one's not quoted. This one is quoted. Do you see why these are quoted, maybe, based on those other ones? Droid space sans, Sago space UI. So they put it in quotes here. Oh, so it's one word. So it's one word. Even though that's still one word there, they still quoted it. So this is just the most foolproof way that the, that the system finds the font, mm -hmm. especially if it's got spaces. You want to when quote it. When in doubt, quote it. And even if it doesn't have spaces, it's, they still quoted it because it's, it's a unique font not built into the system, perhaps. <coughs> especially SF Archery. So our trick here is that we can apply multiple CSS attributes and properties uh, to multiple selectors. The aside element, apply that. The, the image cropped class, apply these. This is new, we haven't done this. We can add commas to say, apply that stuff to this and this and this and this. And then the purpose of that is that all my headings now get, get that font. So yeah, we can apply multiple we can string multiple CSS selectors here uh, just for fun, and I know this will look weird, so I'll put a P tag. I also want to apply it to paragraphs. First I said make plain old paragraphs <coughs> Roboto regular. Then I'm saying make P tags SF Archery. It doesn't apply everywhere, perhaps, and that's okay. And that, oh, let's see it applied there. Um, and that's because, again, the complexity of working with a framework like jQuery Mobile in that there's a lot of moving pieces. There's elements inside of elements. There's CSS rules applying to a parent element and a child element causing things, and maybe I'm only targeting one of those elements, the child element, and therefore it doesn't, doesn't obey. So for me, adding p tag did change plain old paragraphs inside of my collapsible element, but not in the button. And over here when I went to computers and looked at a particular screen, it didn't change it there either. That's because we've got some elements inside of other elements, and then it's uh, we need to further target. But you do want a basic sort of font for your basic text, so the default that we've got up here is fine. Maybe you browse fontscroll.com and find an interesting basic font that has some character, but still readable. And what I could do is, I'm seeing, for example, the text of my app's name on the top is kind of puny. So I can further write some CSS here. I'm saying make all my headings a particular font. 
on the next line I'll say make my heading ones larger. I didn't test this beforehand, so we'll see if it works right away or not. But now I'm saying, okay, now let's further refine the look of H1. Font dash size, uh, just to see what it looks like, 150%. That might not work right away, most likely because there are other elements in play. If that doesn't work, we'll talk about how to, how to change that, but we've talked about a lot so far. Let me take a quick show of hands here. Any, anyone need a little help here getting this to work at the moment? All right, let me help a couple people, then we'll go on in just a quick moment. Um,
All right, so if you got your font working, that's that's good. What I'm trying to do here is to make the font larger. I've said heading one, make it larger, and you know I'm saving it and I'm running it and it doesn't seem to be getting larger. Um, I don't know, just to be really obvious, let me put a huge number. Sometimes it depends on the font. Yeah, even with a huge number, it's not it's not quite doing it. Just to confirm here. That I'm on that I'm actually doing something well what about my h2 sometimes you need to do a little detective work and try stuff so my code is sound I am making it larger uh, I put it on h2 and it did make h2 larger but I'm trying to make h1 larger so this is what I'm saying about you've got elements inside of other elements that you need to be perhaps more specific in your CSS this is why CSS when we said previously the levels of difficulty, it's the second hardest. HTML is the easy one, then we've got CSS a little harder, and JavaScript is the hard one. H, uh, CSS, you might think after we discuss this a bit, that one sounds like it's also the hard one. Because it could be very difficult based on the <coughs> structure of your CSS file. Let me remind you of this. A while ago, <coughs> line 15, a side, a, float right. There's no comma there. And that means something very different than that. This is not saying apply float to the A tags and the asides. Commas basically mean and. Apply these CSS properties to these elements. This one and this one and this one and this one. That's what the <coughs> commas are. When we've got them simply stated like that, basically that means that this element is inside of this element. We have an A tag inside of an aside without the space. Basically that's what that is. So most likely that's what we're going to need to do here. A plain old h1 is not good enough because most likely that h1 is inside of some other element that is not allowing this code to fully take hold. So this is where we need to get into the huge discussion about bringing back the good old development tools in the web browser, either Firefox or Chrome. So let's do this. I'm still trying to get my heading to be big, my heading 1. So I'll leave it back to heading 1. Make sure you save that. And I'm confirming that my design is not obeying me. That little piece right there is not changing. I know that I can change it because welcome did change. And so here's what we need to do. We've touched on this before, I think, and now we'll do some more. You want to right-click my SDCE at the top. You want to right-click the element that you're trying to edit because we need to do a little detective work here. Right-click the, the top element there. Inspect element. I'm in Firefox. This should work in Chrome as well, but I'm in Firefox at the moment. This pulls up my element inspector at the bottom. As I highlight various things here, they highlight on screen. I chose to inspect that element there. It's highlighted. It's also here in the code. There's H1. H1, blah, blah, blah. And this screen here is very powerful, very useful, especially when we're dealing with design, with CSS, but it's very cumbersome to read because there's just so much to look at here. My cliff notes about this is, whenever you right-click on anything, so if I right-click, welcome, and inspect element, 
it highlights it down here. And there's a little path right here. In Chrome, it's at the bottom. In Firefox, it's right here. In Chrome, it's down there. And basically, you read it from right to left. The right is the most specific element. Left is the most general element. <coughs> and on some things, it could be very complex. But notice, there's an H2 there which is inside of a U of an article.ui content which if i click on that highlights you know the whole the whole design basically that's inside of section hashtag #home that highlighted everything simply article didn't highlight the headings the navbar that makes sense in our html code we have a block that says nav and the nav bar is in there and we've got a block that says article and the main content is in there that's why this stuff is highlighted when I click article article and nav and footer and all of that is inside of section this screen of content which we call home <coughs> and the section is in the body of the HTML file so the most specific element to the right to the most broad element on the left. So every time you right click and do inspect that'll jump you to that part or you can also click on this little icon in Firefox pick an element from the page. Uh, Chrome has one too but theirs is a little magnifying glass I believe. If you click on that and then hover your mouse over things in the design then they show up in the code. You see without that highlighted if you hover over anything in the design, the code doesn't highlight. If you highlight the code, then the design highlights. But if you turn on that picker and then hover over elements in the design, they also highlight in the code. This is super useful for us when we're trying to make this all work, especially design-wise. Why isn't this color working? And so if I were to hover, I have that picker turned on, and if we hover over that, h1.ui-title. Hmm, what does that tell me? So I'm going to click on it to fully select it, and it's telling me here. h1.ui-title is inside of header, is inside of section, is in the main design. And so once I click on an element, it highlights it in the main HTML code, and then on the right side, it highlights all the CSS that's relevant. This is another really big, cumbersome thing to look at. But look at this. Hey, that's the code that I wrote, font size 555, and it's crossed out because something overrid it. We read this right panel from top to bottom. From the top is the most specific CSS, Lower down is the most general CSS. Notice that if we go all the way back to the most general definition of HTML, that's crossed out. Ignore that. We define the size of that elsewhere. It defined HTML in the jQuery mobile file, line 3, which was then overridden by the HTML in my colors file, line 16. And that was overridden by deeper and deeper levels of CSS code. The deepest level, level is at the top. The deepest level is element, which is basically inline CSS. The third deepest level, they're divided by lines here. The third deepest is what I was trying to write in my Kodika file line 13, and that was overridden by something further up. Font size, 1M. That's what's overriding me. Something in the jQuery mobile file is overriding me. Um, specifically, it's saying here, if you stretch this out, I'm going to stretch this column out just to be more readable like <coughs> this. Dot UI dash header, space, dot UI dash title, curly brace, font size, blah, blah, blah. End. Some element, some element. This element inside of this element. UI dash title inside of UI header. No comma. 
apply these rules to this target, this selector, and apply it to the footer. Oh, oh. Footer and header. There's a title in the header, there's a title in the footer. Apply this stuff to both of those. And that takes over my code right here. So actually what we want is perhaps not to simply write h1. Perhaps, as this is suggesting to us, dot ui dash header space dot ui dash title. That is selectable. If you can't quite find where I'm looking at, just wait a moment. I'm going to put it on my notepad in a moment. But perhaps that's more of what I actually need to edit, not just simply h1. So that code, I'm going to try it. I'm doing detective work here. I'm not going to try h1 yet. I'm going to try what the element inspector seems to be guiding me toward. Dot ui dash header space dot ui dash title instead of h1. Before I wax poetic on that too much, let me try it. There is a built-in jQuery mobile class. These are classes. The dots mean class. There are built-in jQuery mobile classes somewhere in the thousand lines of, of the jQuery mobile CSS file that define an element with the class of title inside of the element with the class of header in their jQuery mobile because usually that's that's the preface for it, the prefix UI dash that usually means jQuery or jQuery mobile or jQuery UI. Um, <coughs> so I tried that. I saved it. I I ran the index file. Worked. Miraculously, with years of practice, 550%. Um, now very, very readable. And now if I refresh my browser and open up this element inspector again, now if I look in the exact same bit of code here, now look at that. My code is overriding the default jQuery code. I was not specific enough before, and so jQuery said, not specific enough, we take over. And then we said, no, we're specific enough, we take over. <laughs> and that's where that happened. So cross right. We, it's a fight and we won. But this is why this is the second level of difficulty. And you might even think it's the third level. Because there's so many pieces interconnecting here. So many pieces overriding so many others. And we still have inline CSS that could even override that. So if we write inline CSS to that element, that will even take over that. That's the highest level there. See there? It says inline. There's no inline CSS, thankfully. That's why we want to avoid inline CSS. That will always take precedence, even if you are writing all of this great code. Because that's the deepest level of the cascade, cascading style sheets. The deepest level is, the, is this inline level. Actually, the deepest, deepest level is the one that no one knows about. It's the one that you go into the settings of your web browser somewhere here and change it in your web browser. To override it even the deepest level. But no one knows that one. Okay, 550 is way too big. 150 maybe? Better. Only apply to the heading, not to the footer. Maybe I want that, both the same size, maybe I want the smaller size. I have the power to do that here, because remember, this was suggesting me... My sleuthing here told me that it looks like header title, comma, footer title. And then it applies to both at the same time because of the comma. So I can do the same thing here. Uh, UI header title, comma, UI footer title. And both the header and the footer will inherit that attribute. Dot. Yes, dot. Footer. Yes. 
Good thing we have a room full of beta testers. There we go. I think it's too big. So you are going to class override and They could override subsequent ones, yes. If um, depending that the order that they're in. So if further down, 500 lines later on, I write the exact same line of code in 500%, that one will take over. The exact same line of code, just written elsewhere, will take over. Well, you use the same class. <coughs> UI header, UI title. The um, it was over here when when we had it a moment ago, and my H one was right here, right? Yeah. And that one was being overridden. So see here, it's saying H one, and use this styling of it font family. Um, I was not specific enough um, to target the element. jQuery Mobile it, itself said font size should be that. And I'm trying to affect font size with an H1. That's not specific enough. It's not that the class trumps the H1. It's not that the class overpowers the H1. It's that the order that it was that it was coded in is that this is more specific. This is more specific than H1. There is an H1 there. We wrote it ourselves. But it's just that that's more specific to that element, and that's why that takes over. That's why this could be complex. Mm -hmm. Yes? That's even more specific. I'm going to test it right now. Most likely it'll work exactly the same, but perhaps technically that would be better. So I'm going to take it back without the H1, and then I'll just do space H1, because it's an element inside of an element inside of an element. There it is there, and then I'm going to run that again before and after. Huh. Let's do this, save everything. Good. Yeah. So actually it's a detriment, it seems. It seems that if, if I further add the H1, well, it didn't quite work. It's one in front of you. That wouldn't quite work because it should be from right to left. Specific element on the right, general elements on the left. An element inside of an element on an element. So it is from right to left there. It's the one that's not part of the class, so it's not in the um, it, But it is an element inside of it because you see here we've got um, H1. It's got the class title. Uh, which is inside of header class header. So that element is inside of that element. Uh, maybe if we do it like this, there is there are all of these nuances here, definitely. I think if we actually then do it uh, h, maybe h1 dot ui title, technically? h1, the header is, a, is an h1 on top here. Yeah, I guess that's the correct way. No, no space here. Spaces are basically this <laughs> element is inside of that element. You know, children, descendants, basically. And here we are saying definitely this class is attached to that element. Semantics, the other way worked, but here is the most technically correct way. How do you know this? You just need 15 years of experience and it becomes secondhand. Mm. Let's see. No. It does need the, the header. Because there might be. So that's why this element inspector, it's, it's a lot of data to look at here, but. Uh, it's, it's got all the answers. It's telling you what you need to do. It is very cumbersome to, to work with, but 
Again, the yeah, does take the experience. There's a, there's a heading one tag. It's a class. Class means dot. So technically, this is h1 dot UI title, which is inside of header with its u dot UI header. I suppose we could technically write header dot UI header to be even very specific there, and then the heading one. It'll, it work without the heading one because it's just going to assume anything that's in the heading will then be applied the 150 percent without specifying heading right there anything in that header area will be 150 percent even if it's not h1 so if we put in a plain old p tag up there it would also be 150 if we then specify only the heading ones we would have to do it that way there's no space between that's right it's, it's no space. No space. No space. There is a space before it still, because it's this element, this container element, space, this sub element. So we still need the, that space there. <coughs> but now there's no. Now there's no space between these, this element and that class, that object in that class. Would you do the same thing with the footer that gets an H4? The footer's in H4. So what we could do is the easy way as as I had here is simply a comma that dot ui dash footer space dot ui dash title. That'll hit anything that's down there, which at the moment is only in H4. Technically, it would be H4 dot UI title. And here we do have a comma that's basically the and. Apply the font size to this and that. Don't forget that. Or it'll think, oh, you've got a heading four title inside of a footer, inside of a heading one title, inside of a header, which we don't. I don't like that both are 150 actually, so the way I would do it is. In this case, now I would separate it like that and say 125. So that rule for this element and that rule for that one. Commas wouldn't work because they'd apply for both. So 120, 150 at the top, 125 at the bottom. I feel, still think it's large. That one might not even need anything special. Maybe just 110. That's good. All right, let's take a break. I'm going to save my work to the network folder at this point. And we'll get some questions if you have them, and then we'll go on and further experiment with all of this design, the CSS design.